Hello, everyone, and thank you for watching. We're here to discuss how Industry 4.0 is transforming IT requirements at the industrial edge. My name is Nikki Paulson, and I will be your moderator for the discussion. I'm very excited to be here with you, along with our esteemed panelists. Jarrett Campbell, Director of Strategic Alliances Marketing at Aviva. Trip Partain, Chief Technology Officer for Hewlett Packard Enterprises Edge and IoT Systems. And last, but certainly not least, Jim Simonelli, Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer for Schneider Electric's Secure Power Division. Thank you all for joining us to share your expertise on this compelling topic. Before we dive into our first question for our panelists, I'd like to provide a little context around the industrial edge, which may be a new topic for many in our audience. For industrial operators to capture the benefits of increased automation, they cannot rely on cloud technology alone to bring the resiliency and speed demanded by artificial intelligence, IoT sensors, and other industry 4.0 technologies. Local edge data centers are IT infrastructure enclosures, spaces, or facilities distributed geographically to enable endpoints on the network. When in an industrial environment, such as a manufacturing plant or distribution center, this application is referred to as the industrial edge. And it's becoming increasingly important to enabling digital transformation. Now, let's dive into our first question. Jarrett, we'll start with you. Are there any real world scenarios you can share where industrial edge has come into play? When we look at operational technology, things like manufacturing or utilities or heavy capital industries, uh, and you look back at how they've implemented um, technology solutions over the past several decades or their, the history, the, what you see is they, they really started with a sort of monolithic uh, system architecture. It was always on premise, it's critical infrastructure, there are real time requirements, et cetera. Cloud really wasn't an, an available option to these types of manufacturers until recently. And now cloud has provided uh, a capability that they never had before, but they still have those local real-time requirements, uh, computing that needs to be done close to where uh, the actual activity that's being controlled is taking place. And so what we see is a sort of a hybrid environment now where more and more functionality is being deployed at the edge, but then leveraging sort of a hybrid implementation it takes advantage of capabilities that the cloud brings. And so if you think about something like a water utility, uh, a typical water utility may have several water treatment plants, a few other wastewater treatment plants, a whole uh, network of uh, pipelines and pumping stations. And, and all of these things have to work together in order to deliver water to our homes and you know to take wastewater away and, and treat it. And, and traditionally what would have happened was each one of those facilities would have had their own independent um, data center or computing capability. Now what the utilities are doing is they're combining all of those together into an enterprise approach and allowing the systems to operate independently at the plant, but then communicate through cloud technologies and, and interconnectivity that allows them to share information uh, at a broader level. So, so one of the places that we see a lot of edge activity is when some type of manufacturer or utility, it needs a, a local presence, but also a consolidated enterprise present, like a water utility, for example. Trip, same question on, on your end. Are there any real world scenarios that you can share where edge computing has been a factor? Yeah, definitely. I'm going to focus a little more on the manufacturing side for this particular example, but it still fits into the same types of use cases uh, that Jarrett was describing. Uh, in this case, sometimes the technology that's being used also dictates whether you're leveraging something on premise or in the cloud or maybe a hybrid between the two. So one of the things we looked at, this is a contract manufacturer. Think about a Foxconn where you've got a plant that's actually doing manufacturing on behalf of someone else. Uh, and so what happened is they were replacing what used to be a manual QA process uh, with a video-based QA process. So you would have this robot gantry come across the assembly line and spin some cameras around and take a whole bunch of pictures and then process those pictures and then do about 90 different checks of various levels of detail from are the right basic components in the right place as you look at the setup of this technology all the way down to are things plugged and wired together and actually completely set in. 
right? So lots of checks that were happening. And it, what's interesting here is in this particular setup, it was attempted to be cloud-based first. Uh, and the turnaround time it would take for that was about 21 seconds. Um, and the challenge was then they were actually having to slow the line down in order to allow the video processing to have time to work. So they changed that. We changed that out and went with an edge-based solution that was right there next to the assembly line to do the same processing. And you went from 21 seconds to one second, right? So you can see, even though uh, cloud computing definitely has an important role to play as we look at the digital transformation across these industries, you know, sometimes because of the amount of data, the type of data, the type of processing you're doing, edge computing is also needed in, as part of that balance. Uh, and so we, we saw that specifically with that use case, but then also the benefit back to the end customer in this case was not only the ability uh, to speed up now the overall process. So the company ended up gaining 93 seconds per item in, in QA time versus what it used to be manually versus now, but then also an improvement of 25% in the actual outcome of the QA process. So there was 25% less of a time that someone would go plug in their electronics and for some reason it didn't work. So you got a 25% increase in the overall quality output and then took about a minute and a half per, per item out. Uh, and this particular factory does 45,000 products a month. So 45,000 times a minute and a half, big time game savings, big QA savings, uh, and then implementing the right mix of technology. And in this case, you know, having that edge compute right there next to the video analytics that really sped up and drove the process. Jarrett and Trip, those are both wonderful examples. Are there any other industrial segments where you see edge computing applications really taking off? I'll take that, Trip. I would say everywhere, honestly. Um, Trip gave a great example of how speed and compute power uh, drives the requirement for the edge. Um, the example I gave previously was really about distributed geography. So any sort of application where you need kind of uh, to bring together multiple sites or multiple geographies, um, it's a really good application for, for an edge uh, hybrid type uh, architecture. So think about a subway system where you have uh, a preventive maintenance system in place that's monitoring all of your different assets within every single subway station. You might have deploy um, a micro data center in each one of those facilities to track the data to do any sort of real time um, compute or uh, analytics that you need on site, but then send that data up to a cloud where it can be managed in a central processing facility. Uh, we see this in oil and gas where you might have um, edge data centers in the oil field, on, um, also at wellheads, at terminals, all of these things would then come together to give a complete view of the supply chain for an oil and gas manufacturer. So those are a couple of different examples that we see. Trip, anything to add there? Yeah, I would agree. It, you, you hate to always say anywhere and everywhere, but um, I think we're starting to see that because of the nature of the way different industries are now starting to leverage technologies. And I'll give a very quick example. So think about a media company uh, where they have all the different content that's being stored. And then now when you when you go to watch television, typically you're not looking at a live broadcast. You're connecting back to a central source that's got lots and lots of different sets of content. Uh, and there's all the different versions you can watch, right? From the size of your screen all the way down to your phone. Well, they don't keep all of those in all the different versions just sitting there waiting. This encoding of that of that video content happens on the fly. And so if you think about the media provider, they're much like a utility, had these big central data hubs that we all go and connect to. And the challenge you have, right, was what I always call the Sunday night challenge. Sunday night at nine o'clock, back when Game of Thrones was at its peak, imagine the bandwidth that you had to account for when everybody literally one minute after nine goes and gets ready to start streaming that next episode, right? So you have to be able to account for that peak and then you pay for that peak and then maybe you don't use it anywhere close to that same level the rest of the week. So we're seeing media companies now come to us and we're creating by leveraging edge technologies and distributing it out more closer to the neighborhoods, a smart grid for media encoding similar to what the utilities use for smart grid and power, right? So here's a media company adopting some capabilities they see from utilities, then they're using edge-based technologies to actually create this encoding grid that does two things. Number one, 
you no longer have just the one central pipe that you have to account for the peaks. You can actually spread that out and have many more mini encoding um, utilities set up everywhere. But the second thing is now when you also have an outage, you can minimize the effect of that outage because you've got ways to reroute how you get that media out to the end users. So it's really interesting the types of di industries that you wouldn't have thought about looking at edge and IoT that aren't necessarily true industrial, but they look similar enough they can borrow from those same techniques and those same capabilities. As the worlds of IT and OT collide, it's clear that no one company can address every scenario on their own. Jim, can you speak to the importance of a collaborative ecosystem and what value that brings to our partners and end users? Think about the dynamic range of the challenges and the different types of expertises that are required to enable uh, industrial edge um, uh, applications to run properly. There's understanding about the job to be done from a water wastewater facility to a main, uh, to a process manufacturing to a subway environment. All those are very different use cases uh, with unique expertise to understand how they can be deployed. You've got, they're all in different environments. So think about the infrastructure and access that's, uh, that's, uh, that's required. Uh, and then think about the connectivity. How do we actually, uh, you know, get this cloud to device connectivity working operationally? Those are very different mix of environments, skill sets on, uh, on applications, skill sets on, uh, on different types of technologies. And no one company is in a great position to do any one of those things. It really, more than anything, it really fosters this interesting collaboration. Now think about it, if I think about uh, like an industrial system integrator who might be very, very close to the, the problem, maybe an expert in water wastewater or in manufacturing process, um, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I need to figure out to, to, to do this in, a, in an edge environment. I need some IT expertise, uh, understand what the limits and constraints are on, uh, you know, on that side. Um, you know, how do you make that simple? Uh, and you start thinking again about how do I put a system together, where, which requires, again, connectivity with uh, uh, in the environment, um, you know, processing at the edge and then connectivity back and then housing that in, in a complete infrastructure. So it, it's uh, there's no doubt that that has to come together. How do we make that? How do we make that simple? Um, the other thing you start seeing is as these use cases start emerging a bit is, um, you know, it's, it's part of a, a collaboration that you start seeing, um, you know, between different partners like Schneider is partnering with HPE, with Aviva, with Lenovo, Stratus to put together what we're calling industrial reference designs. And these reference designs are these called these bricks, these, 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 uh, these, uh, you know, integrated systems that make it easy for, uh, to, to see how these can come together. So you can focus more on the problem to be done and less on how do I build these systems overall. So no doubt that it definitely takes this ecosystem of expertise in the environment, expertise in the computing, expertise in the infrastructure, combined with simple combined systems that, that kind of embody that with a bit of an education or learning path to make it all work together. Let's dig into that ecosystem a little bit further. Jarrett, based on your experience on the OT side and working with industrial system integrators, what role do they play and what opportunities can they expect when it comes to industrial edge? So Aviva is a commercial off the shelf software provider. We build products that have lots of tools, lots of capabilities, lots of graphic libraries, everything someone needs to go implement a control system. But we cannot imagine all of the specific scenarios, all the details, all the different workflows that a manufacturer or a water utility or an oil and gas uh, provider uh, need in order to realize the, the value from their operations, right? So system integrators play an incredibly important role in uh, you know, sort of that last mile effort of going from a software product to a fully bespoke, customized software solution that meets the customer's needs. And Aviva has a, a very large ecosystem of system integrators that we work with, training and certification. Um, without those system integrators, the actual end users, the water utilities, the food manufacturers, et cetera, would have to have that capability in-house and that's really not what they want to focus on. They want to focus on making food or producing oil or treating water, right? So it allows the end user to focus on their core capabilities while leaning on the system integrator to really understand the software, know how to use it, and how to get the most benefit from it. 
Now, the opportunity that I see as we look at um, edge and cloud and hybrid architectures is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is a, a history and a legacy of control systems in place out there, many of which were built on monolithic architectures. Now, if you start to think about hybrid architectures and how to leverage the cloud and how to leverage the edge, there's going to be basically retrofitting, upgrades, expansions, and, and that type of activity going on in the marketplace. And when you do that, probably the number one thing that's on every single end user's mind is how do I minimize my risk, minimize interruptions, and make sure that when I do this migration or this upgrade or this expansion, that it's trauma free. Like I don't want anything to go wrong, right? So the opportunity for system integrators to really get in there and understand the customer's application, what they're trying to do, and then build out an architecture and a deployment path and a strategy for the software that gets them there. And using pre-canned components like a micro data center that's been tested and certified, and you understand exactly what you're getting from a compute platform, from a piece of software, and then how to use it in that migration, I think there's incredible value that a system integrator can provide uh, to an end user. Now to you, Trip. Same question, but on the IT side. What role can IT solution providers play in this new landscape of ITOT convergence, and what opportunities can they expect? Yeah, I would say from a role standpoint, it's really looking at an adjustment for what they normally do, but understanding that now the environment where you would be implementing has some of its own idiosyncrasies and some very unique differences. But a key part of that role is a lot of the things that have been standardized, a lot of the capabilities that have been, become more of an enterprise class or enterprise level on the IT side, bringing that to the bringing that into the operations world bringing that to the ot side and allowing them to take advantages of where the it part of a company maybe or the service provider has built up these core capabilities maybe they're an expert in something like azure or vmware or uh, or google and some of these different platforms that can be a standard that can now actually support the operations implementations as a baseline, just as they are doing on the IT side. Uh, and so being able to leverage the experience and the commonalities and the expertise that they've developed on that side and, and the role of bringing that in to the operations and allowing for those same standards to plug in. Because what will end up happening to the end user company is, so we're talking about an IT um, services or a solution provider, but think about the IT role at the company where you're implementing. They may already have these standards in place. They are, may already have these expertise. So if you're able to look at what that company already, where they already have standards and expertise and help apply those same ones in the operations world, then the ability for the company to help support itself uh, and not continue to have completely different IT stacks or completely different technology stacks, depending on whether you're in the back office or in the front office, you, you can start to bring those commonalities together. Now, the opportunity, I think, are two key opportunities um, that the uh, IT solution providers can look at. Uh, one is scale. Uh, there's been lots and lots of proof of concepts in and around the IoT world that never end up going anywhere because it was kind of kind of created yet again another silo of, that goes in and solves a specific problem in a factory or an industrial setting, but it was never envisioned or set up in such a way that it could scale. Uh, one thing that the IT side of the house and IT solution providers have gotten used to going all the way back to ERP projects 20, 30 years ago is how to do that at enterprise scale. So I think bringing that scale capability is a huge opportunity. The other piece is I think there's going to be more outsourcing and support options because, again, as Jarrett said, if you're in a, a food manufacturer, you want to manufacture food. You don't want to manage IT. Um, and so depending on where these factories are located, these settings are located, and if that company doesn't have its own IT staff there, I think being able to supplement that and provide that external support to help these new technologies get up and running quickly and stay running successfully, again, to borrow from Jarrett, stay trauma-free, right? I think so that type of a support model is a, is a big opportunity that they're not used to on the IT side that will be present on the OT and the operations side. 
clearly there is a role for both industrial system integrators and IT solution providers at the industrial edge to bring more value to end users who are undergoing digital transformations. Jim, with Schneider Electric's extensive network of IT and OT partners and vendors, we're in a fairly unique position to help facilitate this collaborative ecosystem. Can you speak to some of the mechanisms we're putting in place to bring these different types of partners together to better serve our mutual customer? Sure, it's an excellent uh, you know, challenge and opportunity uh, to resolve. You've got these uh, you know, literally thousands of IT and OT partners out there finding uh, opportunities and, and challenges. How do they, how do they collaborate? You know, it's, uh, it's not an email, it's not a phone call system. You know, how, do you, how do you make that work? So we recognize that early on when we think about this ecosystem and uh, you know, have developed uh, what we call Schneider Electric Exchange. Um, which is a platform that enables our partners to register on and connect to that enables them to actually find one another when there is a challenge opportunity by type or by geography um, uh, to enable them to kind of share and, 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 uh, and collaborate both what the opportunities are, what the challenges are, uh, and begin for, for them to kind of work together uh, you know, across this platform uh, that to make it fast, uh, efficient, uh, and actually kind of in on demand, which is the key thing, because you, you don't want to wait for weeks or, or, you know, or, or even hours sometimes to find challenges. So there's, there's a, to find, uh, find one another. This, this really uh, provides that, uh, that framework, if you will, for, uh, for our partners to, to collaborate. As we're wrapping up our discussion, let's go around the horn in rapid fire. Trip, if you had one message for IT solution providers and what they should be doing right now, what action would you tell them to take? Yeah, if you're serious about this space and you're serious about industrial IoT, go hire someone who spent the last 10 to 15 years supporting technology, whether it's IT based or not, in an operating environment. Get them onto your team and allow that that translation between the way things work in a factory and how it's consumed uh, and your technology expertise to start to mesh together. The solution providers on the IT side that I've seen done have done that have quickly been successful in being able to get a lion's share of opportunities, scalable opportunities in the space. Jarrett, same question for industrial system integrators. What is the one action you would advise that they take right now to capitalize on this market opportunity? Sure, I'm gonna reinforce something Jim just said, which is it's all about trust. The end users are confused. Technology is changing so fast. They don't have the knowledge in house they don't understand the difference between machine learning and AI and cloud and predictive analytics. They just know they want to make food faster, better, more efficient, or treat water more efficiently, et cetera. They need someone that they can trust. And end users are often skeptical of vendors like Aviva or Snyder Electric that, that we have a commercial objective, and it's understandable. They look to the system integrator to understand what is available to them, how it can help them, and how it can be deployed in a way that maybe not clouded by you know a particular vendor's uh, goals of selling them a piece of software or a piece of hardware make yourself that trusted advisor of the customer and you can't help but succeed as you know winning their trust and delivering value to them jim now over to you in 30 seconds or less what would you tell both it solution providers and industrial system integrators to do now? What immediate next step should they take? I would say there's probably three things in 30 seconds. One is you know, to really engage in kind of learning and understanding the other side. There's plenty of learning paths available for system integrators to learn about IT and vice versa. Definitely engage in that piece. The second thing I would say is get an understanding is of, of what does it look like when they all come together? And, and that's you know, taking advantage, understand our reference designs or examples that we put together as a system to see what does a system look like, not just from one dimension. And that's, that's uh, understanding how these reference designs actually come together and what they're all about. That's the second thing. And the third is uh, re repeating the fact is uh, engage, understand what Schneider Exchange can actually do for you um, and understand you know, how and, uh, and how simply uh, this 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 network of partners can actually help solve customer problems uh, faster and more efficiently than it could before. With that, I'd like to thank you all again for sharing your insights on the industrial edge. And on behalf of all of Schneider Electric, 
we genuinely appreciate the continued partnership and collaboration to bring these new innovative solutions to market. And we look forward to seeing what more we can do in the future. Until then, be safe and take care, everyone. <laughs>